Before we move on to our final two contributions, I want to come back to Solly, because what Enrique has just proposed in some ways is maybe even a reinterpretation of what some people would consider the compact city. And for the sake of the argument, let's use compact urban growth, i.e. you do extend the city, but you do it public transport oriented, and as you've seen in most of those images, you do it with flats. You don't do it with small little houses, you don't do it dispersed, and you don't do it car dependent. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, first of all, yeah. uh, first of all uh, I view the preparation of arterial road grids on the, on the peripheries of cities as essential to expansion, and this is what we're driving towards, because we really do believe that the future is to connect uh, these areas uh, to the metropolitan job markets, and the only way to do this is with arterial roads that carry public transport. So the, the, the core is, yes, to have public transport, very, very similar to what Enrique is talking about, throughout the expansion area. I don't think it has anything to do with densities, because low, de uh, uh, low rise and high rise, as uh, we will hear later from Serge, uh, can uh, incorporate uh, high, high density. Uh, in Zhengzhou, in China, 22-story buildings uh, have an FAR of 2.2. I mean, uh, this is ridiculous, because that's just bad planning. So I don't think it has to do with height or with multi-family, single family. I think it has to do with, uh, with the way cities grow. And the way they grow is they become dense over time, but they have to start with a low density be before they become high density. Okay, very clear proposition here. Uh, Anna. Yeah, great. Uh, I would like to hear from uh, Ms. Jennifer Mosisi, who is the executive director of Kampala Capital City, a different perspective something, some flavor from Africa. And I understand planning is needed, I understand efficient planning is needed, we have to identify tools, but I also understand that it's difficult. Uh, you might have several constraints to plan in a city that face economic challenges in a country or social challenges, and also you have political forces in the city, right? So, if you could share. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, the terrain uh, in which this discussion takes place in Africa, uh, and I think a lot of um, other developing economies is very, very different. Um, we do have a lot of limitations in terms of the, say, take the example of Kampala. Uh, Kampala City, is um, 189 square kilometers. But within this area, we have about five different land tenure systems, including private land, public land, and land that's just squatted on. So that makes planning particularly challenging because the policies that affect one land tenure system may not necessarily affect another one. And in order to do any comprehensive redevelopment, you have to have the approval of all these different five land owners in the city. So that makes it quite complex. Uh, the other one is the complex urban and national legislation and policies. For example, we have a, a, a law that exempts owners from paying property taxes in the city, which is very, very challenging because a lot of these owners are actually the biggest consumers of the services that the city provides, but the law exempts them for some reason from paying um, taxes, property rates to the city. So that makes it that much more difficult. And then the other one is the size of the city. Uh, much as we'd like to spread out in terms of uh, providing services and increased facilities, the city space is limited to the 189 kilometers. So the only viable solution for us would be densification at this point, because we do not have the flexibility to expand the city uh, beyond the boundaries that have been set in the law. 
The other one, of course, is limited funding. Um, we want to do a lot of things, infrastructure, social services, but the funding is very limited. So the prioritization sometimes becomes a challenge. Then the other things like the social, um, social acceptance of government programs, uh, the cultures, the political terrain in which we work gets to be quite, quite challenging. And then the um, different cultures coming with different practices as far as land use and land management is concerned. So we find that the discussion for African urban centers starts from a different terrain, so to say, from where it starts in the Western urban centers, because we have to first of all address all these other challenges, the social, economic, political challenges, before we can address the real issues of planning. Uh, Kampala right now does not, it has an approved um, physical development master plan, very, very elaborate, but we cannot implement it because it has to go through a very long political legislative process which is not within our control. So much as we'd like to do the detailed designs and the planning, we are restricted in timing and implementation and funding by um, other levels, levels of authority and power. So those are some of the things that come. But having said that, we are doing as much as we can. Um, the institution I'm heading has been in place for five years now, basically to try and transform the city amidst um, all these different challenges. We've made some progress, but there are still things that we need to work on in these different areas to get to real um, planning and, and, and driving the city to where it should be. Excellent. The conclusion is that your choices are limited. Very, very limited. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, what I would like to ask Serge Salad, who is the president of the Urban Morphology and Complex Systems Institute Paris, to provide his insights about having or not having a choice, and if we do have a choice, how can we, well, which kind of tools we can use for that? I would like to come back to the case for planning of uh, Jean Claude, because I think the case for planning is extraordinarily important. And I would like also to follow Philippe's recommendation to take fast-growing cities. So I will take the example of the most fast-growing city in the world and the most successful city in the, York, in the world, New York, actually. Because New York started from 33,000 people in 1776, then 100,000 in uh, 1811 when the plan was, uh, the, the commissioner's plan was done then uh, uh, 800,000 in uh, 1860, then 3 million in, uh, 3.2 3 million in uh, eight, uh, 1911. So you see the in tremendous increase of, uh, uh, so the instruments were obviously planning, uh, but a kind of very clever planning. The Manhattan grid, which is, uh, you know, these urban blocks are on the north-south direction 60 meters wide, so you see the granularity of planning, and the uh, plots, which are uh, 200 square meters. Planning plus market. So then you have this super high flexibility with the uh, tr right, uh, building rights transfers in New York, where it created a lot of diversity. The smartness of the real estate developers, who, uh, all the estate developers, who created uh, uh, public space, gardens, small gardens, pocket gardens, churches to create neighborhood, complete neighborhoods. So it was a mix of planning and energy. And a very important uh, thing, I was hearing uh, Saskia Sassen, uh, complexity and incompleteness or incompleteness. So actually any complex system is incomplete because complexity is created by uh, dynamics far away from the equilibrium, which are cities, but which are also our brain, our thinking, and all that. So this combination of planning and flexibility, which allows self-organizing processes, is highly beneficial, plus the fact that you have, like in Singapore or like in Venice, an island 
which constrains, in a way, I'm sorry for that, the development. But then the cleverness of the planning was so high that even when expanding at the beginning of, at the end of the 19th century is agreed in Long Island, uh, there was already a culture of planning for uh, uh, making room for urban expansion in a clever way. So if we put it in a synthetic way, of course we should have urban intensification, urban redevelopment. And New York is reinventing itself by rezoning uh, 73 blocks in Manhattan. New York is evolving. Singapore is evolving by creating Marina Bay and Marina Bay Gardens, one billion investment. So all this urban redevelopment, that, and, and, and the topic of the density also, it's, we, we're not, nobody is uh, saying that we should have 60,000 people per square kilometer. But also a very interesting insight that everybody loves Venice. I, I suppose everybody around the table and in the room loves Venice. Do you know that Venice, human, no, density is above 60,000 people per square kilometer? Not tourists, people, living people, living residents. So it depends on the way it is, density is managed at micro scale. Of course, if you have big buildings, big towers, uh, um, uh, poor public space, but if you have high micro scale quality urban life, everybody loves it. You know, you know it's really, everybody's complaining about the tourists, but uh, obviously the tourists love to be here. And it was the most powerful city of the, during all the Middle Age in the Mediterranean. So there is no contradiction between this, and, and Venice was constrained then, uh, ex not really expanding on, on, the, on the land, but all the story of Venice for 300 years has been consolidating the island and also making room for urban expansion. So in a sense there is no contradiction. It really depends on the quality of the planning, basically. And uh, uh, you have choice. This city is a choice. This city is at high quality planning. Singapore, Singapore 50 years ago, was one of the poorest cities in the world, you know, with malaria. Seoul, Korea. Korea was among the fifth poorest city in the world. Just look at Seoul now. Uh, and they made it in one generation. But once again, very clever planning. Accessibility uh, to transit. A high variety of uh, density around transit nodes. Uh, density varies from uh, FAR above 15 uh, or above 20 to FAR about uh, around two or four just nearby for mixed use. So you don't have, because people think about density just like a very high plateau of super high density. If you have, uh, uh, like, in, like in New York, you have uh, very close uh, super high towers. I have nothing against towers, against, uh, but you should have uh, intimate neighborhoods nearby and you should have this high variety, which some cities, and if you look at the most successful cities in the world, uh, Tokyo, Seoul, uh, New York, Singapore, uh, they, in, even London. London is reinventing itself within, uh, within London. So no contradiction, everything is possible, but just follow this case for planning. Uh, and not only like a rigid planning, but planning plus flexibility and plus market response. Okay, can, can I just build exactly on this point where you said there's no contradiction? Because what I've heard from Mark, we have a contradiction. We have a history where I actually wonder how much we can learn from that history for the future. Because if we are considering these issues serious about the resources and about climate, it doesn't matter whether history was on the side of the compact city. History so far has also not been on reducing climate emission or carbon emissions. So there needs to be something which is potentially much more disruptive than in all the curves and all the choices we have seen. And it's not a coincidence that you know, urban sprawl has been referred to as the biggest market failure because the prices aren't right. I mean, we know all of these things. Mark, what, what's your response to what you have heard about the realism which Soli demands from us? I think, uh, I, think, I think a focus on density defined as average density over the space economy leading to a discussion of compact city or not is a complete red herring. It completely masks the real economy and how it works. It's the language of the spatial planner, which we know now for certain after 20, 30 years of critical urban studies has masked the logic of urban capital accumulation. The bottom line is that we need to focus not on average densities and compactity, that language. We have to focus on the strategic intensification of selected urban nodes 
in a hierarchy with transit-oriented uh, uh, development investments to ensure the proper infrastructures are in place so that you do not go the car-based mobility route, exactly what Enrico is, is talking about. So if you want to call it expansion or not, uh, as a result of doing realistic uh, uh, calculations like Enrico is doing in his city, and therefore certain strategic nodes are necessary beyond the current boundary, do that properly and go for TOD rather than TRD. TOD is where, TRD is where you do transit-oriented uh, invest, transit, uh, investments by traffic engineers to solve congestion problems. And the property developers buy up the land on around the nodes and make a killing. That's rent-seeking. Transit-oriented development is where you connect your invest, you do your transit investments for urban regeneration and development purposes, where you capture the land values, uh, increase Im improvements around, around, around the stations. If you do TOD properly, and you have carefully selected your strategic hierarchy of, ne of, 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 of nodes that are critical for your economy, you can guide the market. If you, have a, if you say, prepare for urban expansion, oh, and by the way, let's, it's a good idea to do densification along the way, you can have all the property developers and the financial institutions clapping their hands, because underneath that, they can, go, they can make a killing. And I, I have real problems with that. We have to prepare for a post-financialized financialized world. We have to prepare our cities for people and for effective mobility, just like the mayor and the deputy mayor talked about this morning. That's the kind of politics we need. And the, the, the depoliticized language of spatial planning masks that. That's what I'm worried about. Yes, great. Uh, Mr. Close, I would like to ask you a question. After all we heard, the political difficulties um, in African cities, uh, the limitation of Latin American cities, already built Amer uh, Latin American cities, the price of the land, and the limitations of spatial planning mentioned by Mark. So coming back to the Habitat 3 discussions, I come from Brazil. You know well that uh, Brazil uh, is uh, divided about the compact city because of realistic and pragma pragmatic reasons. So how do you see this debate moving forward into, in this Habitat 3 process about compact cities um, within uh, the uh, nations, the countries? Well, uh we are, we are uh, um, asked uh, by, by, by the General Assembly of the United Nations to provide uh, some kind of focus uh, Habitat 3 agenda, something that uh, the, the decision makers, they can understand and hopefully they can implement. Because if we look at the outcome of the Habitat 2 agenda, the outcome of uh, Istanbul, it's totally modern. We, we can sign it now because it's about values, it's about, you know, very principles, and, and we agree with that, and nothing has uh, changed in, in this region. The problem is that uh, since 96 to today, the practice of urbanization has not followed the 96 urban agenda at all. Then, uh, of course, if we are only intellectuals or, or uh, that we don't care much about the implementability, uh, then that's good, no, no problem. But if we want to improve the urbanization of planet Earth, we need to uh, be able to promote an urban agenda that provides some kind of uh, pragmatic orientation. And we are defining that in, in a couple of questions. Who should do what? In improving urbanization. Because in many parts of the world, it's not clear uh, the who, and it's not clear the what. And, uh, and I am questioning myself if academia and intellectuals, we are providing uh, any guideline for that or any help in this conversation. Uh, who should be done or who should be doing and what? Uh, for example, if we take uh, the case of Kampala, 
uh, you know, to improve the condition of Kampala, what is needed and who should do it. And uh, when you address the, you, 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 you focus on these kind of questions, there's another, a very different set of language that begins to emerge. Because, uh, you know, you, you immediately go to a very substantive uh, roadblocks. Huh? Okay, legislation is fundamental. Legislation should be addressed in Kampala. If you don't change the legislation, there's no way that ever you are going to do any rational plan in, in that city and probably in, in also in, 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 a, in a Bogota it happens the same. Then who should uh, change the legislation? Is that the mayor? Or uh, we need to recognize that in the current state of things there's a new need of, uh, especially for developing countries, I'm not talking about our cities in the developed world, because our cities, we are very rich and we can adapt and, and no, but the problem is that the real poor cities, that they are urbanizing very rapidly. I, I have uh, deal with many cities like Kampala, several, and when you say, well, but uh, why don't we try to change the legislation. Say, no, impossible. <laughs> impossible. Why impossible? No, because this is impossible. No, just, there's no even, there's no even, but for example, uh, I tell them, in the West, a uh, hundred years ago, when changing the uh, legislation was very difficult, very impossible, in some countries we invented this idea of doing the law for the capital city, the specific law. Instead of changing the law of land of the country, which will represent a civil war, then why don't we limit the problem and we say, let's change this, the law of Kampala. Let's create a special law for the capital. And that can be the same also uh, in uh, Bogotá. Uh, because, you know, you need to be able to acquire public land without expropriation. Uh, you need to address the five regimes of property of land. And we, if we don't create specific tools that, by the way, doesn't generate a civil war, we need to be creative, but in situ, not, not theoretically. You know, the Kampala cannot be, in question, cannot be resolved uh, in theory. Juan, can I build on precisely this point? And it is a question about Kampala and it links also to Bogota, whether there is, isn't there a unique opportunity where at the moment of making greenfield land available for urban expansion, you're not only laying the grounds for you know, the basic infrastructure and a system of city for the years to come, you're inventing institutions at that point. You're inventing, the, if it's formal, even the plot sizes, and you're setting something in stone, which, you know, a lot of people refer to have enormous path, has enormous path dependencies and lock-in effects. So you want to get this moment right. And the question for Jennifer in that regard, you said the city can no longer expand you're now facing a situation where you need to change the existing system. Is this working? Or is this just a complete nightmare because you have locked into a system that wasn't steered at the moment of initially being urbanized? Um, without saying it's an absolute nightmare, <laughs> Which <is>? um, <laughs> it's still a challenge. Um, Dr. Kloss talks about making specific laws for Kampala, land acquisition. Urban centers in Africa are political hotspots, in addition to being social hotspots and economic hotspots. So whether you take an action to do with the society or social issues or 
regulation, more than likely it will end up as a political issue. So talk of civil war, um, it always ends up being a political discussion. Uh, so whereas we have laws for the city and the, the beach to make regulations for the city, there are national legislations which override the city legislation. So whereas we may make these policies, they have to be approved at a higher level to fit within the national law, which is not within our control a lot of the time. And um, take the example of the making laws that work for the city, like the one I mentioned on the exemptions of owner-occupied properties. Um, we have, as a city, made the proposal. We want this revenue to come in for the city. But having made it, it then goes to the national parliament, which then has to amend the legislation to enable this um, to be done. That is where the challenges begin. First of all, because a lot of the members of the legislature actually personally affected by this change. And so the discussion takes on other dimensions a lot of the time. So those are some of the, okay. the challenges. Thank you. Very helpful. And now, Enrique, the obvious question. How do you ensure that your urban extension piece has well, the institution in place, or the institutions, that it doesn't fall back into the more conventional pattern of peripheral urban development? No, I, I think, first of all, you have to have a plan, as John says. Second, I think clearly it cannot be done, as I mentioned, either by private developers or by local municipalities. It has to be a regional plan of some kind of authority. Uh, but first we have to know how much will cities grow. Now we we're talking about Africa. In Latin America, while the country's population went from 50% urban to around 75 to 80 percent urban, the population from 50 to 75 or 80, the population of largest cities grew by more than 1,000 percent all over Latin America, and the cities grew by more than 2,000 percent. Why? As uh, Soli was saying, because people want larger homes, but more important than that, because households become smaller. So if you go from five people per home to two, you need twice as many. Plus, also, as cities become richer, there is much more non-residential building, shops, offices, buildings. Then, another thing that is important to have clear when you consider redevelopment, redevelopment simply is not economically possible because it's too expensive. And the more you restrict urban expansion, the more you increase the land inside the existing city and the more difficult you make redevelopment. So, uh, clearly, uh, that is something else that is necessary. Just one thing. In Bogota, for example, the national government makes a road, invests $1 billion in a road from Bogota to a nearby city in bridges and tunnels. These roads has 3,600 trucks every day. But we are willing to invest $1 billion over the last five years in order to save 15 minutes to these trucks. The new city that we are going to build will generate not 3,600 truck trips daily, but more than 5 million trips daily. And no institutions are ready to invest money in making the city grow in the right place. And nothing is more important for mobility than that the city grows in the right place. Uh, just a short thing. One thing that is clear is that private property does not work well, does not produce good results in the case of growing cities. Because different from all other goods, as prices increase, supply does not increase. So the market does not work. So uh, I just say I agree that we have to plan some kind of city planning to have giant arterial roads, not for cars, but for pedestrians, for bicycles, for buses, also for a few cars. Parks, there are some things we cannot do later on. It's very difficult to demolish 100 hectares of city to create a park afterwards. So I think that clearly is necessary 
that we have to grow on greenfield land with density. But again, I say we can do a totally different kind of city, even much better than anything that exists today. But there is so many myths around this. There is the myth that it's possible to make more density. There is the myth, for example, in Bogota, we created this green belt, uh, completely arbitrary. But then later they made up the story that this was the most valuable ecological piece of land in the planet, even though it's full of greenhouses and buildings. And But then there is many resistances. Even people just they don't want to admit that the growth is necessary. And so while we are talking here, the cities are exploding crazily everywhere without any planning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Solly, I wanted to also come, come back to you, and uh, maybe you can uh, link your contribution to also the following question. Let's just come clean about one fact or one question. So we have seen that there is currently an urban expansion coefficient of 3.45, possibly even higher, so the ratio between population growth and land growth. Do you think we need to bring this down or not at a global level? Thank you. Philip, uh, I think again to my yes, I'll answer your question, and I think I has, have to follow up on what uh, Sarah was saying. In some places, uh, trying to uh, ch uh, increase densities is a ridiculous idea. In Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, for example, has the same density as Hong Kong, uh, but with people living in 120th the floor space. It's highly overcrowded, and the densities there are increasing over time, other than decreasing, which is the global average. So not decongesting DACA is a ridiculous idea. And uh, to follow on what Serge was saying before, uh, when Manhattan uh, was developing in, in the 19th century, densities there tripled, and uh, it became very overcrowded. And part of the uh, planning for expansion had to do with uh, uh, taking over four more counties, creating a grid plan for the rest of the country, and bringing in the subway system in the early 1900s. So that made for realistic decentralization and decongestion. So you might, you're getting to a point that we wanted to discuss and never got to, is whether there are such things as optimal uh, densities. In some places, uh, there clearly densities are way too low that they can't support public transport. So, for example, if there are less than 30 or 50 people per hectare, we can't support public uh, transport. This is not the situation in most of the developing countries. So, when we talk about urban expansion, and Mark, I'm actually surprised, uh, says that this is going to be a boon for developers when we talk about urban expansion. In a lot of the cities that we're working in Ethiopia, there are no developers. We wish there were developers. There are people building their homes. So it's not a matter of making these places affordable so that developers make a bundle, but that the people who want to integrate themselves into the urban economy uh, are able uh, to, uh, to afford uh, housing. Thank you. Is the global, let, let's get the microphone. Is the global urban land take at the moment too fast or not? Is the global urban land take the expa the, the, yeah. the, the space, the, the time and the, the pace of urban expansion of land take, is it too fast? Yes. Okay. And the reason is again, uh, that we have different ideas about compactness. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these developers, and some of them, they're public authorities, are actually want to go very far into uh, uh, green land to have new projects that do not interfere. They don't actually want to develop in a compact way uh, immediately adjacent to the city. That's what uh, Enrique is just saying. They want you to develop. Yeah, go 50 kilometers, you can develop. The whole idea is to make cities more compact by forcing the development to be adjacent to uh, the present development and by changing the rules. Here, the, uh, Jennifer is saying the rules don't allow that. In many places, minimum plot size is 500, 750 square meters. Yeah, that creates uh, uh, problems. And that's in a lot of cities in Africa, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, 500, 600, 700. So we need to be able to change the rules. And I really worry, together with 
Dr. Kloss, are really worried that the rules are getting in our way and that we're not, this, is, this place is the place to come to some understanding that the rules need to change. We cannot continue with the present set of rules to create the kind of cities that we need, which are more compact, more held together, better public transportation, uh, higher densities. Uh, we're allowing this to go by and continue in this uh, disorderly manner, and we cannot afford to do that anymore. Footnote for, for Serge, I was just wondering if this expansion is being caused by the big corporations, by the higher incomes, or by the informality. So who is actually... But Serge, your footnote. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, comment about we cannot afford. We cannot afford for the planet, uh, we cannot afford for the resource, but we also cannot afford financially. Uh, because uh, there is something very clear we have discovered, is that uh, we're talking about density, but we're never talking about a concentration of the economy, concentration of jobs, accessibility to jobs. And something we have discovered is that the economy in cities is highly concentrated, you know. Uh, jobs in Zhengzhou, in China, in London, in New York, in Paris, are following a gradient like this, where you have one-third of the jobs, 33% uh, in 1% of the land area. And basically, you have a Pareto principle where 20% of the land area in any city produces 80% of the city GDP. That doesn't mean that you don't need, but so that you have a long tail of urban land which doesn't produce GDP. And the, the, the success of cities like Singapore or Hong Kong has been to cut the long tail, and Venice also, because a really very simple reason, you are, you are constrained. So you don't have, the question is not to avoid expansion, it's to avoid to have a long tail, an excessive long tail of urban expansion, the multiplication by 3.5 of the land area, which is obviously not necessary. But what happens is that this service land costs to the, uh, uh, um, uh, um, to the, to the, to the cities. Uh, uh, and uh, you have the uh, amount of uh, investment in roads, uh, water networks, the uh, amount of investment in networks doesn't decrease like the GDP, uh, either per square kilometer or either per capita. So we have a profile like this. You have a high concentration of GDP, then a long tail of thousands of square kilometers in some case of land, urban land, urbanized, serviced, not producing any economic value, but which costs in terms of uh, infrastructure. And that's a problem you're going to face. If you don't control, I understand you need to decongestion the center of the city. Everybody would agree of that. We are not density fracks. But you need uh, urban expansion. But this should be planned. And this should be, in a certain sense, managed. And this should be reasonable. And if you let the city expand, whatever in the form of real estate development or in the form of slums, you will end up by the need of servicing this area, which is not going to contribute to your economy. So, and you have some kind of break-even point where the city expands, and this is the case in China. And uh, one of the big reasons of the um, slowdown of the economic growth in China is that it has been built upon urban expansion, a big massive infrastructure uh, investment, and this massive infrastructure investment and this massive urban expansion is not producing economic wealth anymore. So you spend on one side, you don't produce economic wealth. And this is the overall global risk. We will end up with a huge amount of service land, which is going to cost a tremendous amount of money in infrastructures, and which is not going to contribute to economic wealth of the cities. Mr. Honklo? Yes, no. I, I think that, uh, fortunately enough, with, with a sample of cities, we are going to be able to produce hard data about that. It is not a question of being opinative. Eh? I think that in the next uh, month uh, we will be able to provide that. Um, by now, the average density of the extensions of uh, the cities that they are built uh, around the wall, they have very low density. Eh? This is something like densities of 4,000 or less 
50,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. And this is unsustainable. The forget, you know, that is very interesting for the market. It seems that the market, the real estate market, it's very happy uh, because probably they sell well this kind of urbanization, the urbanization of 4,000 uh, um, people per square kilometer. But this is not uh, uh, productive in sense of urban productivity or agglomeration, economies of agglomeration. The cost per capita of the service is very high, then it's unsustainable uh, in terms of cost per capita. And of course, as most of the energy that we use is uh, fossil fuels, uh, this increases the, 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 the risk of, of the climate change. Then, uh, apart from the theory and, and, you know, the debate, the nice debate that we can have here in the table, if, if it's good or bad, etc., what is happening every day is that the market is producing, is manufacturing urbanization like a machine of making sausages, eh? very rapidly, at 4,000 inhabitants per kilometer square, that is what it's sold to the market, and this is unproductive, very expensive, and unsustainable. So can a mayor stop the market or drive the market? I like to make clear that when I say expansion is necessary, it's not low density suburban expansion. It's exactly the opposite. It's the way to prevent this kind of expansion. Yeah. Because what we, we, we need to offer the people who are going, why are people going to the low density suburbs, the house with a garden? It's not because they are stupid. It's because they want a play with, place with green, where their children can be, play safe, they can ride their bicycle safe. So I think it's possible to invent a different kind of city, which is dense, where we can offer what they are seeking in the suburbs, the green, the safe places for their children to play. That means high rises with hundreds of kilometers of bicycle highways, greenways, large parks, but in high density. So I think it's very important that, uh, to understand this, that it's not, when we are talking about density expansion, it's not this kind of low density, but it's exactly the opposite, and the only way, more than, more, the way to prevent this, more than to ban this, to restrict this, to put the developers in jail, <laughs> is to offer something which is better, yeah. something which is high density, where, where they will find what they seek, and is much better for them with transit-based development, etc. Well, unfortunately, the debate is excellent. We have to close. Uh, debate will be, uh, the audience will have the chance in the next session uh, to be part of the debate. Uh, but thank you, panelists. Thank you, the audience, for sharing the world of the possible. Thank you.